Hello everyone, this is WVKC 90.7 HD2 Galesburg, the voice of Knox, and this is the big picture where we interview people about their lives, passions, and things like that. Today I'm joined by Frank McAndrew. Um, if you want to just introduce yourself, say, I guess your credentials, what you do. Hi, I'm Frank. I'm a psychology professor at Knox. I'm finishing my 40th year here. So Matt and I were just talking in terms of geologic time for my career. Yeah. Um, and I currently have a class with him. I had a class with you uh, my fall term, freshman year, uh, Psych 100. And in that vein, the first thing I wanted to ask you was sort of where, when did you first realize that psychology was what you wanted to go into? What was the, was the spark for you doing that? There's not a very dramatic story, but I'll reconstruct it as best I can. When I started college, I was not interested in psychology at all mm -hmm. because I thought it was crazy people and therapy, and I had zero interest in that. I wanted to be a scientist of some sort, and uh, even when I was a kid, the kind of scientist I wanted to be depended upon what I had read most recently. So mm -hmm. sometimes I wanted to be a paleontologist studying dinosaurs, or other times I wanted to be an astronomer. Uh, I was always interested in animals. So when I started college, I thought I wanted to go into biology and study animal behavior. Mm -hmm. And I think I probably might have done that if I'd gone to a college where there were people actually doing that. But I was very naive. I came from this working class background. Mm -hmm. I went to the local commuter college without ever even visiting it. It was only 12 miles away. And I never even went there for a visit when I was choosing colleges. Wow. So I just showed up and the uh, bio department there was very narrowly training people to go to med school. So you were just studying the human body and anatomy, and, and I was doing okay, but it just wasn't very interesting. It wasn't what I wanted to do. And then I ended up taking an intro psych class for no reason other than it fit my schedule or something, <laughs> and I went in there, and it was very eye-opening because it wasn't just crazy people in therapy. Yes. Uh, they were running rats through mazes and you know sticking electrodes into brains, and it was like, wow, this, this stuff is really interesting. And even then, I didn't have this spark that, ooh, I'm gonna be a psychology major. Mm -hmm. I just kept taking more psych classes. At the same time, I was getting a little disillusioned with biology, so I started taking a lot of English literature classes just because I like taking classes where you just read novels and plays, mm -hmm. and that was the textbook. And I was good at writing those kind of papers you have to write in English classes. So, yeah. uh, but anyway, I started really getting interested in the psych stuff started working in the psych department as a TA, and also I was in charge of the rat colony, so I was the one that had a In charge show. of the rat colony? Yeah, I had to clean it and do all the stuff you do with a rat colony. And uh, so I liked the psychology, and when it came time to go off to grad school, I was excited to do that. I didn't know what it would lead to as far as a job. I was so naive. I didn't even really know what a PhD was, mm. or that most of the people getting it wanted to be professors. I just knew I wanted to keep being a student. You know, I like the lifestyle. And, yeah. And in grad school, if you're going for a PhD, if our listeners don't know this, uh, certainly in any of the sciences, you don't have to pay for grad school. You are fully supported. You don't pay tuition. And it's like a job. You get a salary. Mm -hmm. So this was so cool. I could be a student and get a salary. Somebody was going to pay me to do that. So that, that was it. And um, it wasn't until midway through grad school, I think, where I kind of said, yeah, I can do this. Yeah. That's so awesome. that's the story. That's the story. You mentioned um, that you, there were some misconceptions you had of psychology before you got into it. Um, would you say a lot of those stereotypes persist today? Oh, sure. Today or? Absolutely. Uh, I see it all the time in our prospective psych majors. Um, I'm going to make this sound much more simple than it is, but <laughs> there's two kinds of psych majors. Uh, the ones that show up with the same misconceptions I had, and their interest in psychology is fueled by their desire to help people. I mean, they mm -hmm. really want to be uh, in social service in some way or other, uh, as a therapist or a counselor of some kind. And they're often disillusioned when they take psychology courses because they're not, they, I've heard people say they want to be psych majors because they don't like math. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot of statistics. And statistics involved, yeah expecting that and then they're kind of bummed out about that they don't like the science end of it so much 
some of them end up switching into other fields like Ann. So I always try to make the point, don't mix up the job you want with the major. Uh, I know when I was a student, I thought when you're picking your major, you're picking your life, right? This is who I'm gonna be. Mm -hmm. But it isn't really like that at all. And when you get out of college, one of the last things anybody cares about is what your major was. They wanna know what you could do, and they wanna know if you have a college degree. So if you wanna be a therapist or in the uh, helping professions, you can major in anything you want. Take a few of the right psych classes, but you don't have to major in it. The other kind of psych majors are the ones sort of like me. They usually start off as pre-med, and then sometime around organic chemistry decide, eh, <laughs> this isn't maybe as much fun as I thought it was gonna be. And, and they slide into our department and they're very happy, so. There you go. Yeah, I don't quite know where I fall into that. I think for me it was I took intro to psych and really enjoyed it. And for a while I was wanting to be an education major and become a teacher. But I guess I just sort of realized I wasn't passionate about that. But I am passionate about like how people work and like mm -hmm. looking at that sort of thing, so. Yeah, and that's kind of how I feel about it. I was never driven by the need to help people. Mm -hmm. But understanding people is, yeah. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, and so another question I have for you. Yeah, I guess just what, so we have, of course, mostly college people listen to this or are on this. What was your, I guess without giving away any details you wouldn't want, what was your like college experience like um, uh, on your way to getting those degrees? It was, it was a very different kind of place than, well, it is and it isn't. I, I did go to a small liberal arts college but it was a very vocationally oriented liberal arts college. So uh, most of the students were majoring in business or accounting or things where the name of the major is the same as the name of a job. Job, yeah. Um, and it was probably two thirds a commuter campus at that time. It's changed over the years, but when I went there, it was a fairly young college. It had only been around about 25 years. And most of the students were working class kids who kind of just went across the river to the college with half of their high school class and uh, commuted from home. We all had jobs outside of our school. So, I mean, we participated in extracurricular activities. I was on the wrestling team and I was in a couple of plays and yeah. did some things. But um, yeah, you, you, for the most part, were not living on campus. There was uh, a dormitory student community Mm -hmm. And I had a lot of good friends that, you know, were doing that there. Yeah. But uh, So, in many ways, it was very different than Knox, but the fact that it was a small college it's very similar. made it similar. Now, this might be a bit of a tangent, but you mentioned wrestling. When I was, before doing this, I was like, I've had him in class, but I should probably look at his bio at Knox and get a bit of an idea. And mentioned that you had been the head wrestling coach. I was, yes. For quite some time. Like, how, what was wrestling like and, like, what... What did you get out of it, and what led to you being a coach? Well, I mean, uh, I never really set out to be a coach, just like I never set out to be a teacher. <laughs> but I, um, I was fairly athletic when I was young, but I was small. Like, I was always, like, the shortest, skinniest guy around. And so I was on my high school baseball team for a year, and I played American Legion baseball. Um, but I just was too small to play basketball or football especially because I went to a fairly large, you know, athletically powerful high school. Mm. So wrestling was like the natural sport, right? If you, <laughs> you've got weight classes for people of all sizes. And I was pretty good at it. Um, I was a state place winner twice and uh, went on to wrestle in college and I was captain of my college team. Um, but I thought that was pretty much it. I went to grad school and I used to work out with the team at my grad school just to stay in shape because yeah. I liked it. But I'd been at Knox about five or six years, and they had a part-time coach. And about a month before the season began, the coach who was a part-time coach left Knox for a full-time job somewhere else. And nobody blamed him for that. Mm -hmm. But here they were, the season's about to start, they don't have a coach. And the dean called me in because he knew I had been a wrestler. And the former coaches had squealed on me as a guy who might be willing to do this. <laughs> So they asked me to do it for just a year to get them by, but I really liked it. And uh, it, was, it became my hobby, you know, mm -hmm. it became the thing I did when I wasn't doing psychology doing. and professor stuff. And uh, some of my closest friends in the world are guys that were, you know, wrestlers of mine that are now 50 years old somewhere, but <laughs> I still see them and we still stay in touch. 
And uh, so I did it for four years. I went away on sabbatical for a year, came back. They'd had a couple part-time guys that didn't work out, so I took it over again and did it for another eight years. And then uh, they, I, it was, I was just getting too old, and I didn't have the time to do it because I was mm-hmm. doing too many other things. So we started getting other people to do it, and I was the assistant for another 15 years till they got rid of it. So They got rid of you? Yeah. Were they well, I got rid of the program. Oh, yeah. Oh, we do not. We don't have. We have not had wrestling since 2015. Wow, that's was it. Just was the interest low. Was well, part of the problem since the 1990s had been that our conference stopped sponsoring it, and we only usually have sports that are conference sports. Mm. But um, the fact that I was willing to sort of hang around and do it for nothing, and we already had the equipment, they said, "Well, knock yourself out." And then about the time that I was transitioning to being an assistant, we had some fairly wealthy alums that were passionate about the sport, and they were willing to support it, and the college certainly didn't want to alienate them. Yeah. And so it kind of <laughs> was going along for a while, but then we had this disastrous series of, uh, we went through three different coaches in three years, mm. and we're in the position of having to hire a fourth one, and the program had dwindled to just a few guys. and. So, so it just it sort of... Just, they just decided to get rid of it. Dwindled. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess alongside the wrestling and the working out thing, I myself have been trying to go to the gym recently. And one of the things I was interested to sort of ask you, as opposed to, you know, looking it up myself, was uh, what sort of, I guess, psychological tips are there to, like, building those sort of habits? Oh, man. Um, You're asking the wrong guy. (laughs) Uh, I'm not as disciplined as I should be. But you've got to find the time of day that works for you. And I found uh, if I wanted to work out, I'm not a morning person, Mm -hmm. but I had to go over there in the morning before I went to my office. Because once I'm at my office, sure, I could go on my lunch hour, I could go after work. There's always a reason not to leave. There's always something else you can work on, or the phone rings, or somebody comes in. And uh, so for me, that's the only way it, it could happen at all. Is finding the time to do you it. you got to find the time that fits into your normal schedule. Mm-hmm. Because if you're constantly trying to choose between working out and doing something else, the working out will always lose. Yeah, I, I've resorted to, because it's a beautiful thing, the technology we have, I've resorted to Google Calendar. Mm-hmm. Like my, I even have sleep scheduled because wow. that's how much it is. I don't always follow it to a T, but it kind of helps. You kind of cross the line there, I think, you know, yeah. schedule and sleep. Yeah. Well, <laughs> for me, it's just, it helps remind me, like, my phone will vibrate and say, you should be sleeping right now. And I go, you're right. Yeah, and okay, it's sort of just a friendly there, reminder. There is a method to the madness. You're right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I was just curious about the psychological means. But I know you, your actual PhD is in experimental psychology, right. correct? Right. Yeah. So, yeah, I've never been a therapist or a counselor or, of any sort. Um, and I started off actually studying animal be- my first couple of publications were mm-hmm. animal research and I sort of I guess my approach to social psychology is it's just like being an animal behavior but humans are the species I study yeah like or the that. specific yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I guess to go back towards just sort of life questions um, when along your journey of going through college, uh, becoming, you know, majoring in psych, did you meet your wife? I met my wife when I was a senior in college, and she was a sophomore, and uh, we, you know, had this thing for a few months, but then I took off and went to grad school, and so we had this funny on-again, off-again relationship over five years where, you know, we would see other people, but Mm -hmm. I would come back, you know, it was just after uh but we the relationship grew stronger and after a certain number of years it was either we're gonna have to just call it off or get together yeah and you guys and, chose yeah we're still trying to figure it out yeah. <laughs> even now yeah even now so now that so that's really the story yeah. yeah well that's nice yeah it's interesting to think most of the time and i guess i haven't looked at statistics for this but i imagine the major statistics are once you're you know long distance or whatever like one person goes off to another thing, those don't typically work out. It's hard. It is hard, yeah. And, um, well, and in, in college is where this happens so often because there's not many other times in your life where you're surrounded by 
a whole bunch of other people exactly your age, mm -hmm. um, interested in roughly the same kinds of things, and yeah. Uh, so, yeah, an awful lot of college relationships end up as marriages for sure. Really? Is that like? I guess I would ask. I guess there wouldn't have been experiments done about this, but like, statistically, do you know like, do most marriages happen from college then or is there a different trend in that regard well i mean you know for people who go to college mm -hmm. I, I don't have any statistics i wouldn't be surprised though if it was more than half more than half of first marriages at least yeah like uh, the yeah. divorce rate in america at least is like 50 well and for people that get married i uh the summer after college i bet i must have gone to eight weddings of people who got married like right after college mm -hmm. and i think there might be one or two of those couples still that together. are still together yeah yeah it's interesting they say the divorce rate has risen and i guess that i'm not entirely sure why that's the case i imagine maybe it's just as time goes on we are less attached to that tradition or yeah although i do think it's gone down a bit i'm uh if i recall i mean it it really peaked and is now, it's not nearly as low as it once was, mm -hmm. but it's lower than it was at some point, maybe 10 years ago. 10 years ago. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I guess here's another question. What brought you to Knox? I remember first day of social psych, you mentioned that this other well-known psychologist almost got in. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. But <laughs> that, that's a real side story. But yeah. uh, the academic job market in most fields is tough. So... You can't be real picky about where you're going to live. So if you want to be a professor, you're not going to be able to probably do that where you grew up. Mm -hmm. You're probably not going to be able to pick exactly where you, where want, you to want to work. And that's especially true if you're coming from a sort of non-prestigious graduate program like I was. So uh, basically, you accept the first job offer you get, and you go there. And uh, Knox was my first offer. And I came here with the idea that I was only going to be here a year because it was just a one-year visiting position yeah. at the time I accepted it. But things happen. Um, I had another job offer in the spring of the following, my first year, and we were just about to have a baby. And this was uh, not really a better job, but it was in a place I thought we'd rather live. But we really didn't want to have to pack up and move with a brand new baby if we didn't have yeah. to. And... That was the time, actually, where they were interviewing other people for this position, including two guys who both went on to be very eminent psychologists who would not have stayed at Knox. Yeah. If they had come here, they would have been they gone in a been year. Gone. Anyway, so, um, so they offered me the job because I kind of gave them an ultimatum. If they didn't offer me the job, I was going to have to take this other job, so they did. <laughs> and there was not really a point where we ever sat down and said, okay, this is it. I'm staying at Knox College forever. But it was a big deal when we bought a house, finally, after mm. we were here like six years. That was at least a visible sign that we're going to be here for a while. Yeah. Not necessarily the whole while, but... Yeah. And so I flirted with a couple of jobs um, over the years. I had an interview 15 years ago. Yeah, that's right. 15 or so years ago to be the department chair at Colby College in Maine and was prepared to take the job if they offered it to me, but they did not. So I stayed, and I'm too old now to really go anywhere, and nobody's mm -hmm. going to hire me at this point. And that's all right. Well, I know in fairly recent time you've gotten pretty well-known for your creepiness research and all that, right? So yeah, you've been a great inspiration to me. <laughs> what? You've been a great inspiration to me in that regard. I'm just kidding. Oh, <laughs> I see. No, yeah, for sure. But, like, I just find it weird that, like, colleges wouldn't jump at the gun to get you on if you've been... Yeah, but it's it's a question of age. You know, I'm mm -hmm. in my mid-60s now. I'm not going to go somewhere and work for yeah. 15 more years. And sure. so, uh, and also they'd have to pay me more. See, the other thing to keep in mind is colleges and universities are not, for the most part, wealthy, except mm -hmm. for the elite ones. And they would have to pay somebody like me twice as much as a brand new coming out of grad school professor. So yeah, that's the story. There you go. Um, there is sort of a silly question I have surrounding your research. I've 
And told a rumor, I didn't look into it because I wanted to ask you that clowns had issues with your research. They did, yeah. I had a, a gang of angry clowns. Uh, occasionally, I still hear from them. Um, all right, to, to clarify, I didn't do any research on clowns. I did research on <laughs> creepiness. And one of the things that came out of this was the finding that people perceive clowns as being one of the creepiest professions. Hmm. That's it. And there's this one little line in the study that I published uh, where we're listing creepy professions and clowns came in number one. Number one. That was all. Uh, then when this killer clown craze a few years happened, a few years ago, 2016. Yeah, I remember yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. Where allegedly clowns were showing up terrorizing people all over. Most of them turned out to be hoaxes. But anyway, I was approached by, uh, it was the Daily Beast, that wanted me to write an article about why would clowns be creepy to people. I'm not the one that decided they were creepy. They were creepy. But yeah. given that people think they are, why might that be? Mm -hmm. So I wrote this essay that got picked up everywhere. I mean, it was in Time Magazine and all kinds of places. And suddenly I became the visible voice of the oppressors of clowns. And there was this ringleader clown on the West Coast who, um, started harassing me on social media everywhere. I mean, just lambasting my reputation and bad-mouthing me, and he was leaving voicemail messages on my phone and getting angrier and angrier that I wouldn't return mm. his calls. He called the dean and the president of the college in an attempt to have me, if not fired, at least severely, severely. reprimanded. And uh, the dean actually had to call me in because <laughs> she promised me, she promised the clown that she would talk to me about this. And um, yeah, the whole, and this, by the way, is all in an attempt to show me that clowns aren't creepy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which didn't so, work out. Yeah, so I live in terror that this little teeny car full of clowns is going to pull up in front of my house sometime. And yeah, I just so yep. I've, and there's a really interesting topic. I, I think you could have an interesting word on of how. It wasn't you saying clowns are creepy. You were just, you did the research, you did the experiments. I was trying to explain why clowns would why be Why clowns would be creepy. Yeah. Um, do you see that a lot where the sort of researcher gets a lot of anger for... Oh, it, yeah, well, especially, not so much when you publish in an academic journal, but whenever you publish anything in sort of the popular press or out there on the internet, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what you write about, 90% of the comments are vicious and angry and negative. I wrote an essay that was very, it's still very popular and getting passed around about why we feel so bad when our dogs die. Yeah. Now you would think, who could possibly be angry about that? Yeah. I've gotten some of the nastiest mail from people who have lost a child mm. who think I'm being insensitive because the editor, uh, when this first appeared, slapped a title on why losing a dog can be harder than losing a relative or a friend. Mm. Now, nobody ever mentioned children, yeah. or, but people right away go there, and uh, so even that, and I heard from cat lovers, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's, I just find it interesting how, I don't know, like, people don't get angry at the fact that this is the researched or, like, experimental case, and more. They dismiss it as junk science. Yeah. I mean, you, I, I'd like to see who these experts are that are regularly, you know denouncing the quality of the science that we do, but they're not. I mean, they're, yeah. It, would you say that there's been a growth in, I guess, anti-science speak with the internet now? Like where people can like find their group of people who agree on the same thing? And I think that's probably fair, yeah. Because it used to be you're sitting there by yourself and there's no way to sort of hook up yeah. with like-minded others, but now you can create websites where people find each other and they convince each other that, yeah. <laughs> and it's hard for the uh, untrained eye to go on the internet and mm -hmm. tell the legitimate sources from the, you know, yeah. the, in it's that case places. It's really hard. Like the most I do, and I don't know how efficient, effective it is, is just click on like the name of the person who wrote it, like mm -hmm. see what else they've done. But yeah, I, it's really hard to find sure. something that I could be like 100% sure is. And when you just Incredible. see if you've got a news feed and the headlines are just coming across, it's hard to distinguish the, mm -hmm. you know, the sheep from the goats. And 
Yeah, so I do think it's a real problem. Yeah. Like rises in, um, I know, the whole flat earth thing has been increasing. and Yeah, conspiracy theories of all sorts. I also think there's a thing, uh, the internet gives people the opportunity to, uh, all right, if there's a so-called expert on anything, mm-hmm. to have their name and comment up there in print right next to theirs, almost like an equal authority. Yeah. And, uh, of course, anonymously denounce whatever it is they don't like. So, Would, would you say, do you, has there been any research really done on people who believe in conspiracy theories or conspiracy theories in general? There there been... actually, yeah, actually, there, there are people studying that right now. I don't know as much about it as I'd like to, mm-hmm. but um, conspiracy theories are associated with all kinds of other personality traits and so forth. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, basically. I was, I was wondering, because I haven't heard too much about your creepiness research. I know you have talked about it a lot, but would that maybe play a part, the fact that, like, we're always kind of suspicious and we choose to believe. Well, yeah, if you're going to make a mistake, you always want to make the mistake in the cautious direction, Mm -hmm. right? So if I'm not sure if something is dangerous or not, if I decide it is... That's safer than... I haven't lost anything if Mm -hmm. I'm wrong. But if I decide that something is not a threat, but it really is, I might pay a pretty steep price for that. So... We've kind of been selected to automatically go to the worst case scenario and assume that's true until you know otherwise. (laughs) Which is why I was sort of thinking conspiracy theories, and I'm sure everything's always more nuanced and you need the more research, but that could be a part of it, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe? Well, one of the things uh, that there's a psychological trait known as uh, tolerance of ambiguity. Uh, And if you score high in that, it means you're comfortable just saying, I don't know, it's, you know, like we'll wait yeah. for the evidence to come in. Uh, conspiracy theorists tend to score very low in tolerance of ambiguity. They want closure. They want answers. And they don't like being able, not being able to say what's really going on. Yeah. So if a conspiracy theory explains things for them, they're good. They're good. Yeah, yeah my dad is really into the whole JFK Oh, yeah. thing um, he's read a lot of books but he just told, looked at he just told me one day like there probably isn't any conspiracy because the one thing my dad realized is that you can't and it's true you can't keep secrets like there's this big secret organization yeah. you would have heard about it by now sure. especially a lot of people who would have been in charge back then have like died and you would expect one of them would say on their deathbed something like oh yeah it was all a hoax or yeah no uh, another thing conspiracy theorists without intending to do is to dramatically overestimate the competence Mm -hmm. of humanity in general that you could have this many people that skillfully carry something out and conceal it Uh, it just doesn't work that way you're right I mean in a very short amount of time first of all the conspiracy wouldn't be successful Mm -hmm. and even if it was it would never be kept quiet I forget where I heard it but someone said that it's better to assume that, especially involving like government things, that they were just dumb than yeah. it's some great scheme. Yeah, I don't think you'll ever go wrong uh, betting on that. Yeah. Um, so I have a pretty fun question for you that I am excited to ask. It's basically, because your PhD is in experimental psych, there are certain limitations in experiments, right? Resources, the ability to get people in. Sure. What experiment would you really like to do if you had just unlimited resources? Like, what's the experiment you'd want to try? Wow. It's a big question. Yeah. (laughs) And I don't think I'm going to be able to answer that one. I certainly wouldn't want to just blurt something out without thinking about it. Because uh, there have certainly been many times in my career where I've done a few small studies and thought at that time okay, wow, what I'd really like to do here is Is this. this. Um, But right now, at this moment in my career, I can't say I have that one thing Mm -hmm. that you're really That I'm just itching to do, no. No. But it is an interesting thought that, like, a lot of experimenters, like what you said, like, people say psychology is the 
a study of college, soph- sophomores. college sophomores. Yep. Yeah, it'd just be interesting to see if like I don't know if those studies got more funding or just more resources, like what they could do. Mm-hmm. I mean, within the ethical sure. sphere of things, but well, and the ethical constraints are probably a bigger constraint on then, what we'd really like to do <laughs> than the financial ones because you could ask really powerful, interesting questions. Now, I'm not proposing we get rid of ethical mm-hmm. considerations and research, but, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's rough because a lo- we learned a lot of interesting things doing those unethical experiments, but they were unethical. And sure. it's, I guess it's hard to balance the pursuit of knowledge well, and it's, I mean, the, the, it's a very real question for, um, for example, the Nazis did all kinds of unspeakable things yeah. in the concentration camps, uh, but they have scientific data from that. Should that data be made available to scientists to look at and talk about or yeah. not? Uh, people it, argue about things like that. It's a big yeah. debate, for yeah. sure. It's, it's terrifying. Um, have there ever been... Are there certain, like, out in the media about psychology, are there certain, I guess, pet peeves or misconceptions that you hear all the time that get you kind of down? Well, to say that it gets me kind of down would be a strong statement. But, yeah, um, everything is always made much more simple than it is. And nobody really wants a sound, anything more than a sound bite. When I first started doing... TV and radio interviews about research. Uh, the first couple of times I would do my homework and have all these facts at my fingertips and be really ready and nobody ever wants anything more than a superficial <laughs> uh, glib summary of the main talking point and they always want you to go beyond what your data actually says which is okay uh, I'm always willing to speculate and say yeah. well here's what I think But the problem is then when that gets reproduced, they don't make the distinction between what I know to be true and my speculation. speculation. They just say, expert, Professor Frank McCandry (laughs) says, says. and then your colleagues see that and say, did you really say, you know? (laughs) I will say, in class, I really appreciate, and I've I've talked to people about this, I really appreciate how in class they'll say like, I'm not an expert on this, and I, but I would think you make it very clear when you're stating like a professional opinion or a fact about based yeah. on research and when you're not. And Other professors don't do that? I, I, I would think with you it's just much more obvious. Okay. I don't want to call out other professors. So my, my ignorance is more apparent is what you're saying. <laughs> yes, but that's not a bad thing. <laughs> that's not a bad thing I don't think though. I think it's like humble, humble. And like to be able to say this is my profession, this is what I know, mm-hmm. and I will tell you my speculation on these other things for you to consider. And I think that's sure. much better than just saying things without citing or... Well, I also think part of it comes from just being older and you get more comfortable and secure. And it's almost like when you first come out of grad school and you're not much older than the students, I do think a lot of people have this need to be thought of as an authority figure. There, mm-hmm. There's an insecurity about, do people really accept me as an expert? Whereas uh, one of the few benefits of getting older is people assume wisdom. Upon you. Whether there's any there or not. There's an old Yiddish proverb that basically says that long whiskers are no substitute for brains. So just getting older doesn't make doesn't. you wiser. But uh, it does make you relax a little bit. And, it's, and I'm more comfortable saying, yeah, I don't really know anything about this. And I don't think people are immediately going to dismiss me as well. That's yeah. what he's talking about about anything. Okay. Um, have there been any? I'm kind of jumping around just because I'm very curious, but I also don't want to keep you in this hot room forever. So okay. I feel like I'm kind of bouncing around. Um, I guess to get back a bit more to your life, um, when you first you said you didn't want necessarily to be a teacher right away. Have you grown to like teaching oh, with yeah. time? Or? Absolutely, I have. Um, I never wanted to be a teacher. I never thought about a professor, right? Mm-hmm. I, I didn't want to be a high school teacher or a grade school teacher. I never took a course in education yeah. or anything. Um, but when I was a graduate student, part of the way I, got, I supported myself was being a graduate teaching assistant. 
and so I started teaching classes because that's what you do. You know, if you want your money, you <laughs> teach these classes. And I don't have a specific memory of when it happened, but I must have had a good day or two where I remember thinking, yeah, this is kind of fun. I could do this. Yeah. Uh, so I started grad school not really knowing what I was going to do. I mean, relatives and other people would ask me, well, what good is it? You know, what are you, how are you going to make a living? And I would just say some vague thing about, well, I'm going to do research. I had no idea where one did research or who paid you to do it. Yeah. I even, I just wasn't aware that I was on track to become a professor. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, I enjoy my relationships with students mm -hmm. as an advisor and a coach. And I, I hope it's apparent in my classes that I kind of like being in the classroom. It's fun, it's mm -hmm. entertaining and engaging. Um, nobody likes grading anything. Yeah. Nobody likes hassles with students about grades or honor board cases or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But day in and day out, if you're getting paid to talk about stuff you're interested in, to read about stuff you're interested in, it's not, it, it's not bad. It's, not it's bad better than you know selling tires. Mm -hmm. And I would say you definitely of all like lecture style classes, I find myself most interested in, yeah, water is a good, lovely thing. Um, I find your class is the most enjoyable for me when it comes to lecture style classes. Well, thank you, I appreciate um, that. Yeah, it's like, you make it entertaining. Um, maybe it's just a certain way you speak. I have no idea, but I'm certainly always interested. Well, and I've kind of gotten, over the years, I, I rarely have a small class. I mean, mm -hmm. most of my classes are, are big. And so I have taught preceptorial and some small seminar classes. And I enjoy those, too, where you sit around and discuss something that you're reading and class participation is part of the grade. Yeah. But I just don't get a chance to do it very much. So by default, you have to be a lecturer. Mm -hmm. Do your lectures change very much class to class or...? Uh, you mean like year to year? Or, or just date? like date. So like, do you teach, I guess it would be year to year because it's not like uh, high school where like you teach three math classes in one day. You're just teaching the one social psych. I have taught, uh, like I teach in the fall, multiple sections of intro psych. Mm -hmm. And I can do the very same topic in the two classes and have two very different experiences. Uh, sometimes it's me. Um, you're more energetic or tired yeah. one time than the other. Uh, but a lot of times you're at the mercy of the students. It, all it takes is a few enthusiastic, talkative people in one class <laughs> and a complete absence of any of them in the other no, no. class, and the experience of the two days is very different. What? I'm, this just, I didn't even write this down, but I'm really curious. You were mentioning energy levels throughout the day. What period would you say, just from your own uh, anecdotal experience, seemed the most tired and compared to most awake? Is there like a almost bell curve of like okay well first and second period are bad because <laughs> the students have been up late or all night and they're really tired and there's no life at all third and fourth period are bad because it's getting to be lunchtime and they're hungry and it's hard to focus uh, fifth period is bad because it's right after lunch and they just ate and they're getting tired mm -hmm. and sixth period is bad because it's the end of the day and nobody wants to be in class at that point so they're all just they're, they're all terrible yeah <laughs> I, I do think, I used to teach first period a lot, mm -hmm. and I don't do that anymore, primarily because the students as a whole are really, they, they're lifeless. Yeah. yeah. And it, it's nobody's fault, it's just the way it is. I, so far, I mean, I guess I'm not superstitious, but knock on wood, like, I have not had a first period class. I've actually kind of tried to avoid them because I know I wouldn't be able to, you know, properly participate in a class that's eight in the morning. Sure. Um, it'd be really rough. Uh, if you're gonna teach one at eight in the morning, I've had better luck, uh, like with a preceptorial class that's discussion-based, mm -hmm. because at least people feel like they have to talk. And yeah. It helps them wake up. But a lecture class at that time is just deadly. Yeah. Just doomed. People will be sleeping. Yeah. In the class. I mean, people sleep at all times of day, but it's worse, first period. All right. Um, let me real quick look through my list. I hope people have been enjoying it, and I hope this fan has been all right. I've at times been like, I hope this fan isn't making the sound weird, but 
I think it's fine. I'd much prefer to have it than to not have it. I think so, yeah. <laughs> so there's no air up here, huh? Air conditioning? No, there... It's one of my many complaint concerns oh, oh, yeah. I put in this. Yep. There just needs... I think they just need to invest in more fans. Um, that's that. Oh, um, that's a really good question. Have there any been any recent psychological studies, experiments that have really, like, surprised you? Like, something that came out that was sort of astonishing? Uh, I guess by this time in my career, it's hard for me to be astonished <laughs> anymore. And most individual studies that come out, it, it's very rare for some brand new thing to just to sort of pop. drop. Um, because the way science happens is each study is another drip. Um, think of how a stalagmite gets formed in a mm -hmm. cave, right? Drip by drip by drip. This stalagmite represents the stuff we know, but it's made up of a bazillion tiny little studies, yeah. which is another one of my pet peeves, getting back to one of your previous questions. Um, those of us in science understand that one study is just one tiny piece of the puzzle, but the media, and I don't blame them because this is how they attract how they readers, they will take a finding from one little study and sensationalize it, and that's why people sometimes lose respect for science. Uh, let's use health things as an example. Yeah. Is coffee good for you or bad for you? Is drinking good for you or bad for you? Because it's easy to find a study that can take either side of that issue. And what you really have to do is patiently wait for dozens and dozens of studies, studies. to pile up and then see, okay, across the board, mm -hmm. what's the consensus here? Yeah. They tend not to do that. They just pick the one. It's the idea of... I think the scientific method step that gets skipped over the most is the peer yes, yeah. revision step. Yeah. And so I'm not surprised that your pers average person on the street says, well, scientists don't know what they're talking about because last week they, they said, said this, this and now they're saying that. <laughs> well, they're not saying either of those things. They're compiling those things so they can say something. Mm -hmm. They did eventually. a particular experiment that showed this, but they're going to... Yeah. Other people are going to try other experiments. But we're also to blame because we want people to know about our work and we mm -hmm. want to publicize it. And so we put it on the Internet and on our web pages and people pick it up and we're happy to be talked about. But, yeah. It does create sort it of It does a, create a problem. Absolutely. It's particularly with the dietary stuff. Um, there was like the big carb stuff that came, came out. I just from, But looking at this, I believe it's been a while since I've read anything or looked at the story much but it was like carbs are just in general horribly bad for you was mm -hmm. essentially what the study was saying um and they had essentially done like a long period of time a couple years of different countries um and the person i heard this from said but they didn't do france which is one of the countries that eats a lot of carbs and Fran french people are relatively healthy mm -hmm. now this is very anecdotal this was a person just talking to me about yeah. that particular study but I think it shows that we take a study and incorporate it in our own lives so quickly. Well, and we especially like the studies that tell us what we want to hear, well, right? If you're a coffee <laughs> drinker and you hear that coffee is really good for you, that makes you feel good, right? And, and you want that's what you want to believe. Uh, but if you hear coffee's bad for you and causes cancer, well, let's find another study. <laughs> we were talking about that today in class. The um, It was the ABC oh, yeah, 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 attitudes. Cognitive dissonance. Cognitive yeah. dissonance, yes. Yeah. So you'll look for that research that can give that positive association. And you're like, okay. Yeah, like, and you can, distance goes away. <laughs> for sure. Um, up there. Do, do, do. Yes, I had a sort of question for the Knox populace. Um, what would you say is the best um, method of studying, psych like psychologically speaking? Yeah. Also well, selfishly for uh, me. Yeah, well, I mean, different people will respond better to different strategies, so mm -hmm. there's not a one-size-fits-all. But um, if I could say some general things, it's sp spreading it out over time is a lot better than compressed. Mm -hmm. So uh, studying for a half an hour six times is way better than studying for three hours one time. And uh, that marathon eight or 10 hour study period right before a test is very counterproductive. Now, if you haven't done anything before that, 
you don't really have a choice. Yeah. But um, it's not really about the amount of time. A lot of times when students are doing poorly on tests or something, one of the first things they want to tell me is the number of hours. They've studied. Yeah, and uh, I always try to point out that 10 hours of doing something dumb is twice as bad as five hours of doing something dumb. You know, it's, it's not the amount of time you're studying, it's what you're doing. And the things that stick with you are things that you think about and connect with your own life. So if you're reading a textbook, just writing things down on flashcards and memorizing them isn't sticking anything. That's like if somebody gives you their phone number and your phone is, you know, down the hall and you got to run down there and you're reciting the number in yeah. your head. It disappears as soon as you put it in the phone. Uh, flashcards are kind of like that. What you want to do is read and think about examples in your own life. If it's a psychology textbook, oh yeah, I remember when this happened to me and you have mm -hmm. this story in your head about that about. incident or... Um, I knew a person who had this problem. That's so much easier to remember. So uh, the idea that thinking about stuff while you're reading is studying is kind of foreign to people. But yeah, so spreading the studying out is one thing. A good strategy. Yeah. All right. And it's not just, um, it's, it's like anything else. It's a skill you get better with with practice. One of the problems we have in psych classes is a lot of people who aren't science students who don't regularly have to digest textbooks have trouble because they're just not used to doing it. You know? Yeah. All right. Well, to go back to your life as we sort of approach the ending topics, I guess, for conversation that I have lined up at the very least, um, what have you... I remember in Psych 100, we talked about the bystander effect, and you mentioned how that actually greatly impacted your, how you kind of went about your own life. Have there been other such examples of where, through your education of psychology and the different things we've learned from it, have actually helped you in your own life? I think so, yeah. I mean, the bystander effect, for the benefit of people who might be mm -hmm. listening who don't know what that is, if there's a lot of people around when something happens and somebody needs help, uh, you, we get inhibited and you're less likely to help if other people are there. Knowing about that has made yeah. me more helpful in these public situations because I'm aware that people that are going to be inhibited resistance. about that. Yeah. But it's also, I think, knowing about our cognitive biases in some ways has made me more patient with people because when I see somebody falling into one of those self-serving bias traps or whatever it is, mm -hmm. Instead of vilifying that person and talking about what a jerk he is, I understand he's just doing something we all do. Maybe just to a slightly greater degree, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, or maybe not. I mean, <laughs> because it also makes you aware of your own self-serving biases. So I see this guy doing something that I know I must do myself as well. Yeah. And that allows you to give him a little bit of a pass. Um, I think I take things less personally when people get angry uh, because I recognize the things that make that happen and it isn't just Yeah, it isn't personal. About me. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, if anything, I think it's made me more patient with people than I might be otherwise. Yeah. Uh, in that same vein of how psych, being a PhD in experimental psych and having been doing evolutionary psych and all these different things, um, and I could be guilty of this in this very interview. Have you had people almost come to you and ask you, like, you who must know everything about psychology, like, unlock the secrets of the mind for me? Have you ever had people <laughs> sort of come to you asking no, you these? No, nobody really does that, but what is more common, uh, and this isn't just students, but, I mean, other adults that I run into in yeah. my life, they already have a, an idea about what they think is right. Mm -hmm. And what they want is for me to confirm that for them. <laughs> so they're not really asking me to explain how something works as much as tell me that I'm right about this. Um, any sort of broad examples of that? Well, I mean, uh, maybe a silly example, but when my kids were little, um, I got to know you know their friends' parents, friends parents, and I would coach soccer teams with them and all that stuff. and. Uh, knowing that I was a psychologist at Knox College and all, they were 
are often very conscious of trying to impress me with their good parenting strategies, mm. like limiting the amount of TV their kids watched and all these other things, and uh, in some ways seeking my approval for that. And it was usually kind of disappointing because I didn't worry about that stuff mm. that much. And so those are the kinds of things I would regularly... The other thing that every psychologist, no matter what their specialty runs into, when they meet someone at a party or something and they find out you're a psychologist, ooh, I'll bet you're psychoanalyzing me right now. Mm -hmm. And what do you say to that except, <laughs> you know, no, I don't do abnormal psychology. Yeah. <laughs> so, or that, or even more so, not any more than anyone yeah. does in general. Like people, I think people are constantly, right, psychoanalyzing each other. Isn't that yeah, to yeah, a degree? Yeah, sure, using the, the word the way it's commonly used. Yeah. Um, but psychoanalysis, and I could be wrong, generally refers to like Freud and yeah, it's Freud a very strictly speaking, it's a very specific view of how humans work. Yeah, and a very specific style of therapy. Mm -hmm. So I guess the more correct term is you are constantly analyzing, analyzing each other. Yeah, yeah. But I understand when people say that. Yeah, they don't mean the strict Freudian. Mm -hmm. They just mean yeah. you have these. You have insights into my soul. Soul. Yeah. yeah. And I should start really saying, yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> start, like, saying thing. You could do uh, the Burnham statements. Or oh, Barnum, the Barnum statements. Barnum yep. statements. Yep. And just really bring them on a wild ride. Of the, like, oh, my gosh, you know me so well, and I just met you. <laughs> well, and sometimes in interviews, people will even say something like, you know, well, what do you think about it? And then I'll, my response is usually, well, you don't want me to say that right here in front of everybody. And that usually <laughs> ends the conversation right there. You know? That's really good. Um, so I had a sort of general topic, which was something I've been really interested in lately, particularly in my own life, um, is how our own evolutionary, because I know you have a background in evolutionary psych, our own evolutionary history and how that affects our daily lives. Like how sleep, we're, we mess up our sleep schedule because we have lights Yep. And we aren't programmed to have lights 24-7. Yep. And so our, our brain chemistry isn't allowed to reach its night state. Um, so I guess just as a general topic, um, what are some things that you see people struggle with the most that have its bases? Well, I mean, almost everything. I mean, uh, evolutionary psychology is all about this collision between mm -hmm. our cave man, mind brains and the 21st century. Yeah. Uh, so we didn't evolve in a world where there was mass media. And so we get tricked into being fascinated by celebrities because we know a lot about them. And that pushes buttons in our brain that tells us these are socially important people and you need to know more about them. And uh, sometimes we dismiss people who are interested in celebrities as being shallow and we're above that. But in fact, what they're doing is very normal. There are people who they know more about than their next door neighbors. Yeah. And when you think about it, celebrities are sort of friends in law, right? Uh, we live in a world of strangers, which is another thing we didn't do. Um, we evolved to live in very small groups where you knew everybody. And so having to regularly deal with strangers who are very different from us and with mass media, it, there's just this mismatch. Some people think that a lot of mental illness is the result of uh, our evolved, being evolved to live in one kind of world and mm -hmm. suddenly the world we live in is not a good match for that. And this leads to anxiety and depression mm -hmm. and all kinds of other things. Yeah, I mean, the food we eat, the different... It's just so interesting how we've gotten to the point where our technology goes faster than our own biology can go. Absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, you mentioned food. We love donuts <laughs> and things like that because if you encountered food with that kind of energy in it, I mean, you could not get enough of it. And you had to be ready for the next famine. Mm -hmm. um, but our bodies are not prepared for this world where you can be chugging down, you know, energy drinks and eat don't. I mean, yeah. so yeah, it's very counterproductive. For sure. Um, in that same vein, for some reason my brain just went, no longer know what I'm talking about. Um, in that same vein of evolutionary psych, um, are there issues we run into, especially with experimental psychology, where we aren't sure if this is a biological thing 
that's broad across the board or a strictly 21st century um, cultural, maybe even Yeah, I mean, I think thing. we always try to set it up that way, but almost everything is the result of an interaction between, between our biological predispositions and our local circumstances, mm -hmm. which we usually call culture. Yeah. And to try to say, well, it's definitely this or that, or that. is usually making a false dichotomy. It's usually mm -hmm. what you're seeing is the outcome of those two of things hitting things. each other. Yeah. I Last term, I had a human origins teacher who almost every topic, he'd be like, in all likelihood, it was all these things, just a mix mash of all these different things. But people will argue that. Mm -hmm. um, so that does make sense to me. I guess, do you... So in which case you would say people aren't, or at least people in the actual scientific field aren't really looking to distinguish those two things? It's more... No, not really. Um, that's more of like a general public... Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the simplified talking point in the media yeah. version of it. Of it. Okay. Well, I'm glad to have that um, in my mind. Um, yeah, I think the biggest thing for me is sleep. I've been particularly interested in sleep lately. I listen to... A podcast uh, it's called the Joe Rogan podcast. Or he, I know Joe Rogan. Yeah, have you? I know of him. You know of and him, and I know people who've been on his podcast. Yeah. but um, he has like professors. He has interesting people on, so I'll give it a listen. I mean, he had this like psychologist whose expertise was sleep, um, and he was talking about how like the whole light thing um, and how we stay awake. It just it interests me so much how like like our brain needs to get cooler and how there are all these like facts about us biologically and psychologically that if we just took if we learned help our lives in magnificent ways and I guess all, what I'm, all I'm trying to say with that is that education about these scientific truths are so important you don't you're preaching to the choir <laughs> this is this is what I why I exist yeah so yeah I'm not going to disagree what out of curiosity, what did bring you to start talking about these topics like creepiness and gossip? Um, just fluky things. Um, the gossip thing, I, really, I can trace that to a particular day. I was at the grocery store here in Galesburg, and the line wasn't moving, and I happened to be standing in front of the rack full of magazines, you know, the tabloids with the movie stars all over them. And, yeah. And for the first time in my life, I started thinking, how do all these magazines stay in business? Who is reading all this stuff? Why do we? Why do people care about, you know, the royals and the yeah? And so that got me to wondering about it. And being a good scientist, the first thing I did was to go to the literature, and find out what we knew about gossip and celebrity worship. And I was blown away that there was almost nothing there. Nobody had really studied it. Uh, certainly in the psychology world. Um, I think I was the first experiments on gossip hmm. that were done. There were some studies of gossip done by anthropologists over the years, but basically they just sort of hung out in these different cultural groups and listened in to what people talked about yeah. and described it. I was uh, one of the first people to actually come up with some hypotheses about, okay, if gossip is an innate human predisposition, something yeah. like our love of donuts and sex mm -hmm. we ought to be able to make some predictions about what types of people we're interested in what types of information we're informa interested in and so I started doing studies on that um, but it can all be traced to that one day of wondering why people read these magazines and the creepiness thing was sort of the same I, I don't know why but I suddenly just noticed how often I heard people saying they were creeped out by somebody or they found yeah. something really creepy so I started asking people, what do you mean by that? Yeah. You use the word. What What does it mean to you? Because it's so different from scared or... Yes, yeah. yeah. And I found that people had a hard time being more precise, but the kinds of things they were saying were very, very similar. And so I decided to do a, a study on, again, if creepiness is what I thought it was, we would see certain patterns and... So a lot of what I do just comes from my walking around in day-to-day -day life saying, huh, I wonder how, why this happens. All right. Well, I'd say it's been an hour. I am going to pose two more questions to you. Okay. Um, I've been really happy to have you on, like genuinely. I was... I'm happy to be here.
slightly nervous. You're the first professor I've had, so this is a good experience for me to do this at the very least. It's a bit different interviewing a professor than a fellow student, definitely. Yeah, I would think so. Yeah. Well, this next question, sort of topics I like to talk about a lot is how each of us, we have our own, like, we have struggles we go through um, in our own lives. Um, What would you say were some struggles you went through and what advice would you give from the literature you know of going through struggles varying from like grief to just times of stress? Um, I have to say that I've been lucky to not, I, I'm, I'm s- sort of a low stress person, mm-hmm. I'm not a high anxious person, uh, I'm not predisposed toward depression. Um, so I, I think compared to a lot of people, I've probably had an easier time of it. Yeah. but. I mean, there are uh, things that major transitions in your life are hard. Uh, when you lose someone that's uh, near and dear to you, you grieve. And mm-hmm. I think the thing that you really have to um, keep in mind, we talked about this in our class already, Yeah. The not to put too much emphasis on one event as dictating the whole rest of your life. Mm-hmm. Uh, when people commit suicide because of a failed love affair or they flunked out of college or whatever it might be. Yeah. They have to keep in mind that this will pass and your whole future happiness depends not just on that one thing, (laughs) but on everything else that's going to happen. It's going to happen. And people lose sight of that. They really blow up whatever the present crisis is. And I, in my youth, was guilty of that as well. And so, you know, the one thing I would try to get people to recognize is the the fleeting nature of the stuff mm-hmm. that you think is the end of everything for you because it isn't. But, um, I mean, things in academia that you have to get accustomed to that are stressful, it's constant rejection and evaluation. I mean, I've <laughs> gotten more rejections from professional journals, I think, I, I, I'll go out and let and say more than anyone else in Knox College <laughs> because I write a lot and I send a lot of stuff out and uh, in academia, there are a lot of people who are attracted to academia that take that so hard. You know, the rejection is so devastating. Yeah. They, they leave the field. They, they just can't handle it. You have to get used to, you got to fail and be okay with it. Mm-hmm. And it's not always easy. <laughs> yeah. It's never easy. But so I guess that's the kind of advice I would yeah. give. Yeah. I mean, being okay with failure is a really big thing. Like even... Because if, if you're not okay with failure and you fail, you're going to like be down for a long time. But if you're like, you know what, this is just a part of the step, you're able to get up much well, faster. And it weakens you. I mean, uh, these people that go to pieces if they don't get an A in a course, you know, yeah. if this is devastating to you, just wait. I mean, yeah. the stuff that's going to come along later is a lot worse. For and sure. you learn from it. And you learn that life does go on. Um, I mean, I think being a wrestler helped me in many ways. Uh, there's few things more personal than walking out there in front of a crowd and having another guy beat the crap out of you yeah. in front of everybody. And you get up the next day and life goes on. And mm-hmm. yeah. For sure. I mean, that's really lovely message. And I apologize, you have another thought, another question. Um, Go right ahead. Have you, in your raising your own children, have you ever had them come up to you as you've been... Uh, someone involved in the psychology field asking you questions or like going hey what's the like having one of your children walk in and be like what's the best way for me to ask this person out or never a, never never <laughs> neither one of them I've got two kids a boy and a girl no never no uh, I mean it's not that they have never asked me for advice mm-hmm. but the advice has never been advice because I'm a psychologist been because you're their dad yeah and or i'm just an older person who knows stuff like <laughs> okay if i'm gonna you know buy a car what's the best way to finance it or something <laughs> like that you know it, it, yeah so no no yeah, to that no. question absolutely no i'm yeah. glad to hear it because that'd be kind of i get not sad but it'd be an interesting thing but i think that makes a lot of sense because what my mom's an accountant and i don't go asking her for all, accounting for advice, accounting advice all yeah. the time yeah um, yeah, I, you've got me. Th- I've never thought about that question before, but I'm trying to think of a single example ever, and I can't. Yeah, which would seem kind of odd because you would think like you have that 
tool, I use quotation marks, right, at your disposal of, like, this person who knows all this literature on how people think and never yeah, once. Yeah, but at the same time, if it's your own father and you've <laughs> known him all your life and you've seen him in all kinds of situations where he's made an idiot out of himself <laughs> or was incompetent in something yeah. else, you sort of don't really think, think, of, about that. think of him as the, the know-all, know-it-all <laughs> yeah. you know, kind of guy. If anything, it's just the opposite. I mean... You know, you have the same disagreements with your kids that you had with your parents, and mm -hmm. so they, they don't see you as an infallible authority figure yeah. by any means. Has it been at all challenging both being a professor in Knox and a father? Has there been any weird... No, I, th I think, I mean, there's always a tension between, you know, doing your job as best you can and being the father that's there all the time doing yeah. the best you can there. But I don't think there's anything special about being a Knox professor. If anything, it gave me more flexible time than a lot of people have in their yeah. jobs. Yeah, Knox has a pretty unique academic schedule as well with the trimesters and the no, not really many classes after 340. I sure. mean, you have your... Yeah, and so, but I mean, professors in general have a lot of control over their schedule mm -hmm. in a way that people who work, you know, 9 to 5 in nine an office five. somewhere don't. And so, you know, I can arrange my teaching schedule so I can be at the kids' soccer practice at 3 o'clock in the afternoon if I had to be. And yeah. So in some ways it made it easier. Awesome. Are your kids still in high school now? Or are they? No, no, my kids are, um, my son, well, they're both in their 30s. Ah. I'll just leave it at that. Do you have grandkids then? Or? I have one granddaughter who's six. Mm. That's got to be, it's one of those things, we were talking a bit, a bit about this before, and we're like, I think people our age have such a hard time even conceiving of the idea of what it would feel like to like have that three generations of like yeah well people my age have trouble conceiving of that too but it happens to you but it happens <laughs> which life goes on yep. right so yep. you're saying just keeps going well to end this a uh, lovely episode where i got to talk to you about your life and ask you the many curious questions i had um the question i ask every person i interview at the end of every episode is if you could tell future you or anyone watching this anything, like maybe you're listening to this at some point or someone else is listening to this, what would be like the thing you'd want to say? Do you ask everybody this question? Yes. I've gotten, uh, I don't know if you know who Kai Epstein is. He was my RA. I know Kai very well. Yeah, he and his answer was, um, don't procrastinate. It can wait till tomorrow. Like, <laughs> people give all sorts of answers, some deep, some funny. Some. Yeah. Yeah. Don't sweat the petty things. Never pet the sweaty things. <laughs> that's, that's really Profound. good. Profound. Profound. Yes. Don't sweat the petty things. Don't petty. Don't pet the sweaty things. Don't pet the sweaty things. There you have it. <laughs> that's Mick Andrews. Y yep. Closing statement. Thank you so much. Okay, thank for, you for being on. I hope this was at least somewhat entertaining yeah, for you. Yeah, I know it was not the most unpleasant thing I've done. <laughs> I'm so, so glad. Yeah. Well, that's been it. This is has been and will continue to be, I suppose, ninety point seven WVKC HD two, Galesburg, the voice of Knox, and that's that's the big picture. That's it. <laughs>